Hello, and welcome to the Duke Cardiovascular Imaging Conference. I'm Manish Patel here at the Division of Cardiology at Duke University Medical Center, and I'm pretty excited about today's program. It's entitled, How Does Imaging Help Me Make Decisions in Our Heart Failure Patients? And I can't think of two better people to help me uh, discuss this topic. To my far right here, I have Peter Smith, who's the head of our cardiovascular surgical division and professor of uh, surgery. Hi, Peter. Hey, Manish. This is great. Thanks for coming. And then I also have here Eric Velasquez, who's the director of our cardiac diagnostic unit. And he's also interested, obviously, in heart failure, heart failure studies. And so thanks for being here, Eric. Thank you, Manish. So what I thought I might do to start us off is present you guys with a case of someone we recently saw and then have Eric sort of tell us about how we think about heart failure patients and imaging, something you're uniquely qualified to do. And then Peter and I might talk about revascularization decisions again with your help. So maybe I'll start with the case for Great. you guys. Um, this is a 73-year-old gentleman with diabetes and hypertension. And uh, this person works on a farm and had been mostly well most of the life, but I'm not sure he'd been seeking medical help. Uh, recently, in the last two years, diagnosed with diabetes and hypertension. Started getting more short of breath, swelling in the legs, dyspnea on exertion. And then his wife sort of made the patient come seek medical advice. As he was seen by his internist, he was eventually referred for cardiovascular care because the patient was in florid heart failure. So this patient who's 73 with diabetes, hypertension, and sort of not clear how well he's been controlled, presents with new onset heart failure. And when you talk to him over the last six months, probably it's been getting worse in the last month or two, chest pain with some of the dyspnea on exertion. So this eventually led us to, uh, as you can see, this presentation led us to sort of two central questions. How do we use imaging to evaluate our patients when they first present with heart failure? And then how do we use it to make decisions around revascularization if in fact that's what they need? And in this patient, it, uh, it turned out that we were um, going to need to do a revascularization because we eventually did a heart catheterization. And at coronary catheterization, as you can see on the screen, we found that his ejection fraction was 15% with global hypokinesis. And it's not on the screen, but the left ventricular and diastolic pressure was elevated. It was clearly it's 20 millimeters mercury or more. And he had three-vessel coronary disease, fairly complex, 100% right coronary lesion, diffuse circumflex disease, and then both proximal and mid-right uh, LAD disease. So you have a gentleman who's 73 with a depressed ejection fraction, symptomatic uh, sort of for heart failure, first presentation. How do we now use imaging if we need to and then make revascularization decisions? So I thought this would be a good case for us to think about yeah. these um, this is issues. A, this is bread and butter cardiology. Yeah, bread and butter cardiology is something we see every day. So Eric, maybe you can tell us a little bit about how you think about imaging in heart failure and then I'll, we'll interrupt you and tell you what Great. questions we have. Well, I think um, I, uh, I put together some slides just to kind of take us through the strategies uh, and the uh, modalities available to us to, uh, to evaluate these patients who are very frequent. And uh, I think one thing that you mentioned that I wanted to touch on was uh, uh, this, uh, this really addresses all patients who present with heart failure regardless of, of if it's an acute presentation or a chronic presentation. I, I try to take... A, uh, a, a holistic approach to uh, the imaging of heart failure. And uh, with that, let me just kind of go to the next slide and uh, just kind of show you the toolbox. I mean, the toolbox really, uh, we, we're fortunate in cardiology um, among other, uh, compared to other disciplines because we have multiple different approaches to imaging the, uh, the, the organ of interest, the heart, and, uh, and that gives us very different and sometimes complementary information and helps us uh, fine tune our decision making. Uh, at the, at the, at the uh, these tools are, I, I list here echocardiography, uh, x-ray angiography through cardiac uh, catheterization, uh, nuclear imaging, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about that, magnetic uh, resonance imaging, and uh, uh, computer tomography angiography, or CT angiography. What I didn't put up here, which is an important tool to just mention that I think gets, uh, that gets uh, short thrift in this, uh, in this uh, highly technologically advanced society we live in, is the simple chest x-ray. Uh, which I think people should also recognize has a lot of value in determining, at least uh, in people who present with dyspnea for an unknown cause, whether we should be thinking about the heart or not, because the, the, uh, the dimensions of the heart on an x-ray, uh, when enlarged, can point us in a certain direction or another. I think it's a great point, Eric, and in fact, plenty of our referrals, as you know, sometimes are picked up that way. Short, shortness of breath, primary care doctor does a chest x-ray, and in fact, has pulmonary edema and an enlarged cardiac silhouette. So, one may be um, chest x-rays, and the other, I think, is maybe just to touch along as we go along this biomarkers. You know, there's been such a growth with BNP and other serologic mm -hmm. markers that 
And I know it's outside of imaging a little bit, but certainly we now in our armamentarium and clinic think about biomarkers as a way patients are at least. So the, the key point is uh, that we've raised is imaging is not done in a, in a vacuum. Yeah. It's obviously done in, in context of biomarker information, electrocardiograms, and uh, the simple chest X-ray, which can point us in, in, in different directions. But clearly, I, to start, uh, start, I think you know we have to recognize that with heart, in a, with a patient with heart failure, we have certain clear goals. And I speak to this not only as an imaging uh, a person, but with my heart failure hat on as well. I mean, uh, clearly one of our initial goals is to establish uh, what's contributing to this uh, syndrome of heart failure. What's the diagnosis? Uh, heart failure is a syndrome, not necessarily, uh, doesn't really speak to the etiology. And we have to get at some point to the etiology to, 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 uh, to try to, uh, to reverse it if possible. Um, it also uh, allows us to then focus treatment options based on those imaging uh, data, and uh, we'll go into some of that in a second. Uh, some of those treatment options are focused on the, uh, on the short term, uh, and some are longer term decisions, which I think we're going to get to towards the end of this discussion when we talk about revascularization and other alternative uh, uh, devices and, pr and procedures we can add to revascularization. Uh, define the prognosis. Uh, uh, there is nothing probably uh, more well studied in imaging than the impact of uh, imaging uh, markers uh, in heart failure with regards to establishing the likelihood of survival long term. And I think we can, we can touch on that and you'll hopefully remind me of that if yeah. I forget. Yeah. And then uh, really evaluate the response to therapy. I think those are the kind of key variables that we need to juggle as we decide between different modalities at different times during the patient's course. Uh, I think it's great, Eric. You sort of laid out for us as a heart failure general cardiologist how you think about heart failure and, and sort of the key goals. Peter, when you're thinking about the patients that you get referred to, you you know, as a CT surgeon that coming in with heart failure and I'm assuming a lot of coronary disease, what kinds of things are you also looking for? I mean, are you concerned that valvular disease is being missed or another etiology? Sometimes, you know, I see patients that I'm sure you do too where you, you wonder, is the coronary disease underrepresented as the cause of the myocardial dysfunction or overrepresented, or is it a mixed picture? You know, sometimes these patients don't always represent straightforward ischemic cardiomyopathy. That's for sure. And, uh, you know, the worst thing you can do uh, is uh, do a bypass operation on someone for some coronary anatomy and then find out that that really had less to do with the patient's problems than, uh, than you had anticipated. So Eric's point about getting a chest X-ray which automatically occurs, you know, once they get to see me, um, is is a good one because uh, these kind of symptoms can come from intrinsic pulmonary disease. Uh, these kind of symptoms can come from endocrine imbalances, uh, other systemic illnesses. Uh, drug or alcohol abuse can have a role, and there can be non-ischemic elements to the cardiomyopathy. Uh, could be some restriction. Yeah. There could be a lot of different things. I think the number one thing in this kind of patient would be uh, to get an echocardiogram because mitral regurgitation, you know, could easily be involved. I know on the cardiac cath uh, we didn't, it wasn't mentioned, but uh, it would be something we'd be looking for. And obviously we know in patients like this it can be uh, evanescent, it can be present sometimes and not in another. So, you know, the interview uh, about the symptoms in relation to exercise, possibly some exercise testing might be indicated if you were really concerned. But um, we look at these patients very carefully. And then the other thing would be, um, what are the kind of comorbid features are there? You know, coronary surgery is generally well tolerated. And we'll talk later about decision making between PCI and, and bypass surgery or medical therapy. Although it's better to say medical therapy with both mm -hmm. uh, because that's uh, really what we're doing. Um, the decision making there frequently involves risk factors for surgery that make it a, more of a prohibitive uh, kind of event where even though PCI might be high risk, it's still going to be lower risk than surgery. So all those things are, are part of the, uh, the pattern of what we are thinking as we approach these patients. And I think you made some great points and I might have even led us sort of astray without a physical exam, which we should have, or at least certainly without some other information. But on this patient, as we go through it, maybe we'll, we'll I'll try to fill in details, but I think both of your points about the first question really is, What's the cause of the heart failure, and how do you sort of evaluate it? Let me uh, just take you through a few, uh, a few features of the different modalities, and this is not meant to be comprehensive, but just to introduce the subject for discussion. Is, you know, and I, I really do, I am a, a, a 
to be uh, to be frank, an echocardiographer uh, as my main focus uh, in imaging. Um, but echocardiography really is the workforce, uh, uh, workhorse, I should say, of heart failure. Uh, it is, uh, I think, an expectation uh, and a standard of care um, that in patients who present uh, with heart failure, that uh, an assessment uh, by echocardiography should be uh, part of the standard approach. Um, and uh, that's not to exclude other modalities, but just to, to kind of uh, to, to, to start the evaluation process. And what do we get with an echocardiogram? And I think uh, I've listed here some bullets. Uh, we get morphology, simple morphology. How large is the ventricles? How, how are the ventricle size relative to the atria? Uh, are there a anomalies of the, uh, of, of, uh, of, the, uh, of the atrioventricular connections? Um, do we get information on ventricular function? Uh, people always point to this because everyone wants to know what the EF is. If I had one question that's, that's asked to me most commonly among anybody across uh, the last uh, 15 years of practice, is what's the patient's EF? And, and frankly, that is important, but it's not the be-all and end-all. And I, we, we'll talk about that, I think, a little bit. Uh, but ventricular function uh, can be assessed by echocardiography using uh, 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 assessments of ventricular volumes uh, or uh, dimensions and how they change over the cardiac cycle. I would point to the fact that this is an area where we have improved dramatically uh, because the technology has actually uh, caught up with what we wanted to do with regards to the ability to evaluate uh, contractility, more specifically with strain rate imaging, as well as use uh, three-dimensional imaging to really assess not just estimate a volume, but actually measure the volumes uh, and calculate an ejection fraction. Valvular disease, Dr. Uh, Smith here to my, to my right, I mentioned this uh, uh, and it's a critical uh, feature to, uh, to, in real time, assess uh, is there any evidence of stenosis, uh, any evidence of LV outflow tract obstruction, which can cause a, 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 a symptom similar to heart failure uh, due to cardiomyopathy, due to uh, an ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Uh, is there any evidence of regurgitant lesions? Um, hemodynamics, and I wanted to, to point to this, uh, spend a, a moment on this in, a mo in, in, the, in the next few slides, but. But uh, I think uh, underutilized is echocardiography's ability to provide uh, stroke volume information to really able to be able to calculate an out, uh, a cardiac output, assuming uh, uh, basic assumptions, uh, and, to, uh, and to provide information on filling uh, pressures. Uh, and then the issues of diastolic uh, uh, compliance, ventricular filling, and the mechanics I mentioned with strain rate imaging and new, new methodologies to understand uh, the contractile forces generated uh, and how the circumferential and longitudinal fibers of the heart uh, interact and, and what's happening. So uh, I, those, I think, are the, the key parameters that any echocardiogram uh, should provide uh, as part of an assessment of patients who present with heart, heart failure. I think uh, the future holds some promise, although this has been disappointing in general, that echocardiography uh, at least uh, will be able to provide some information on perfusion, although most of us haven't given that up yet. I mm -hmm. think that's a development uh, that's still to be awaited. Um, the other thing to point out before I move on to the next slide is the issue of uh, dynamic versus static imaging. Uh, uh, Peter mentioned the importance of adding e uh, 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 exercise and functional assessments of the ventricle and these parameters during exercise relative to when patients are just sitting in a, uh, lying in a bed. And I think that's very important when, when things don't make sense that we have to investigate further, particularly around valvular stenosis and making decisions about valvular stenosis in the setting of other etiologies for heart failure and, uh, and, and other, other things. We can, we can maybe talk about that later. But let me get to the next slide here and just uh, highlight the fact that with echocardiography, we have within echocardiography multiple modalities that not only depend on two-dimensional imaging and three-dimensional imaging, but also uh, uh, spectral as well as continuous wave uh, Doppler uh, that allows us to then assess uh, uh, using uh, quantitative Doppler techniques, uh, outputs, filling pressures, and what have you. Um, the most common, I think, approach to that of uh, the Doppler equation in echocardiography is to estimate uh, non-invasively the right ventricular systolic pressure. And we do that, and this is a cartoon I have up here, of just by, by uh, providing an estimate of the jugular venous pressure, which we usually do from the imaging perspective by evaluating the inferior vena cava, uh, its size and distensibility, and adding that to uh, a pressure that is determined using uh, a continuous wave Doppler across a tricuspid valve, assuming no other stenoses uh, that are in series, 
uh, that uh, allows us, using the equation of 4 times that velocity, a uh, peak velocity squared, to estimate the gradient between the right atrium and the right ventricle. When you have that gradient, that change in pressure, and you add that to a right atrial pressure estimate, which is the JVP clinically or through the inferior vena cava and, and some assumptions we make, we get pretty good at estimating the RV systolic pressure, which of course is an important uh, determinant of whether there are pulmonary components or is this or something else going on or uh, also help us quite a bit in terms of determining therapies and, and what are, uh, how acute uh, the therapies are needed in terms of uh, uh, perhaps diuretic use and, and other things. Um, it's also a very important prognostic sign. Uh, this is just to uh, 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 could, uh, help the audience recognize that uh, the, uh, the data, although limited, uh, that, that correlates uh, non-invasive estimates of RV systolic pressure uh, by echocardiography and those that are measured uh, invasively in the cath lab, uh, the correlations are quite good, and, and this has become really a standard uh, approach. So let me Eric, I mean, Eric, I think it's a, it's a great introduction, and it'd be hard for anyone to sit, I think, in the world right now and think about heart failure and think about a test that's more uniquely suited for heart failure patients or even myocardial evaluation than echo. I mean, ease of use, we haven't really talked about reproducibility yeah. yet, but ease of use, a patient's ability to get temporal resolution for movement, and as you said, hemodynamics is, I think, one of the strengths of the technique, and then Obviously, we have a wealth of data using the modality in trials and in practice, although, you, as you said, people seem to boil it down to the EF. There's a lot there that we, we look at to, to do it. What are some of the pitfalls with that go? So, you know, when, when I think about our patients with heart failure, I think it's almost, uh, you know, it's a class one guideline recommendation. It's standard of care. It's hard to imagine that there's somebody being seen in the United States with concern about heart failure who doesn't at some point get an echocardiogram to evaluate all the things you said. How can it echo help us, or how can it sometimes mislead us? Well, the, the pitfall uh, of any imaging modality, and I think it, uh, it is uh, particularly important to recognize with echocardiography, is it's just a picture. Yeah. It's not the heart. Yeah. It is a picture of the heart uh, that has to, co to conform to the physical principles of ultrasonography. And so with that, you recognize that the pitfalls may relate to patient habitus and other uh, features of the patient where the imaging is substandard. Uh, how we uh, how we get around that in this day and age is uh, using the, the uh, uh, perfusion agents that allow us to help within the cardiac definition. But of course, other parts of the exam may be limited because of, of uh, inability to penetrate uh, well and get a good picture. Um, it is, uh, uh, although real time is what we always talk about being a positive feature, it can also be a negative because it is uh, looking at a few heartbeats, um, unlike nuclear, which summates perhaps 15, 20 more. Yeah, 15, 20 yeah. more. Um, those would be the ones that I would focus on. The other thing is that it is traditionally in most labs, although I, I am glad to see uh, that m many uh, uh, are moving in a different direction, traditionally de uh, dependent on two-dimensional imaging. Uh, um, what did I mean by that? Well, we get different two-dimensional representations of the heart. Uh, and then we, in our own mind, put that together. Uh, there are mechanisms to uh, reconstruct, but those have been really uh, not well popularized. Uh, I think with the development of three-dimensional echocardiography, where we get not only a two-dimensional representation, but an entire volume of ultrasound data, then, then we are really moving in, a, in, in the right direction. But, but I, I want to highlight a point that I'll come back to again, which is, um, one imaging of modality is typically insufficient because there's a lot of things that ECHO does not provide, and I think that's what I want to go to next, which is uh, really the issue of uh, coronary anatomy, uh, cardiac vein anatomy, uh, uh, information around etiology. Um, uh, I think where, is, uh, where um, ECHO can address the issues of is valvular disease and other things contributing, uh, but when it comes right down to it, even uh, though there has, have been some reports of the uh, heterogeneity of functional wall abnormalities uh, uh, being supportive or non-supportive of ischemic versus non-ischemic etiologies, uh, the data on that uh, is extremely weak and I think uh, from my perspective should not be used for clinical decision making. Uh, I think we end up with needing other approaches and one of them is uh, the try, tried and true uh, cardiac catheterization angiogram where we get uh, not only, hopefully, information on coronary arteries and cardiac veins, but information uh, through uh, right heart catheterization 
uh, on uh, hemodynamics as well and to support what we saw non-invasively. And I don't know if you want to comment yeah, I mean, on I that. Think You're that, the expert in that field. Well, I'll just say that uh, obviously we believe uh, invasive angiography is still a gold standard for, for obstructive coronary artery disease determination. And I guess, you know, I think CT angio is promising. And certainly there are going to be, the way I think about heart failure patients is you got to learn about the muscle and you got to learn about the arteries. And so you might need more than one technique, as you're saying. And so echo is certainly the first modality for the muscle. And then for the arteries, we can talk about CTA or, or um, invasive sure. angiography. Out of interest, Peter, do you take anybody to CT surgery who does not have invasive angiography? Do you ever take the valve patient, the low-risk person, just based on a CT angiogram saying that they don't have coronary artery disease? Or an echocardiogram. Here, if we got a valve disease. Well, I, I think... Uh the answer is we have in the yeah. past. Yeah. You know, before CT angiography was available, we, just we, we would frequently take patients who had very little risk, risk yeah. of having coronary uh, disease, perhaps had a negative stress test even, um, and we would take those patients to surgery, um, you know, with, without any hesitation. I think uh, I might still do that today, but uh, I think, uh, you know, non-invasive tests like that might be indicated to most people. Yeah, so there'll be some 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 evaluation that each patient gets. Obviously, under 40, low risk, you might not do more than some very minimal evaluation. But in the risk population, I think we're still doing invasive angiography in lots of these patients. Let me move on quickly uh, to uh, other modalities which are used very commonly. Uh, I think nuclear uh, testing, nuclear cardiac testing, has been a, 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 also another work for, workhorse of of, of uh, of cardiologists and CT surgeons for decades, and for, for very good reasons, we are. It is, uh, I think, uh, still the standard. If uh, may, there may be uh, the most commonly used, I should say, approach to evaluating perfusion ischemia in the United States uh, because of the availability, and uh, uh, there have been recent um, uh, concerns about the radiation as well as the availability of the agents. Uh, but, but in general, um, as an, a general approach to establishing uh, whether there are stress or rest uh, abnormalities in perfusion, uh, nuclear testing is, is, uh, is very commonly used. Uh, that's, uh, it, it provides information not only on uh, global LV function, uh, it has, uh, but it has the ability to uh, evaluate whether there are I said, ischemia in distributions when they are uh, pr provocative testing, uh, such as exercise or another approach. Uh, and they also provide, uh, uh, there are mechanisms to utilize this information to understand whether non, uh, whether patient, uh, uh, non-functioning myocardium is viable versus non-viable. And that's an issue we'll, I think, get to towards the end. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to I add mean, to think, that. Yeah, I think it's a great summary. I mean, in general, I would say, um, <clears throat> you know, um, nuclear imaging or agents with radionuclide imaging for heart failure patients, I found it to be very beneficial, especially when patients have wall motion abnormalities at baseline and or old known heart disease or heart artery abnormalities because with prior infarction, it becomes more and more difficult for any modality to identify if there's new ischemia. And clearly, I think we have the largest volume of data for prognostic information for nuclear imaging. And so it's probably, I think, standard of care for ischemia testing if you're not going to invasive care cardiology. Right. Exactly. Um, but, but to that point, there's been tremendous advances in uh, cardiovascular MRI um, and uh, uh, you know, cardiovascular MRI uh, also can provide information on uh, ischemia, uh, on uh, on the presence or absence of viability using technique uh, using gadolinium enhancement. Uh, uh, this tissue, this, this approach of hyper uh, evaluating for hyper enhancement, which I'll mention in a second. Uh, I think it is should be the standard of approach to patients with heart failure, or any patients, frankly, uh, who do not have contraindications MRI. Uh, who have a high likelihood of having congenital heart disease because the ability to follow connections uh, and to understand the morphology is, uh, is, is very good there. Uh, uh, and so I think there's a lot to be said for the, the utilization of MRI, particularly in patients. I, I wanted to go into just this uh, schema uh, because I think this is, uh, I think, how many of us are starting to practice with regards to how do we integrate MRI information in terms of our heart failure patients who don't have an etiology defined yet. And as I mentioned, wall motion uh, abnormalities in and of themselves, uh, be they uh, uh, um, in one particular wall or being global, are, I think, traditionally felt to be poor discriminators for ischemic versus non-ischemic causes. Uh, there's some controversy on that, but I think that, uh, at least I, that's my opinion. Um, MRI, 
allows us not to look at how the wall is functioning depending on the current state of the patient at rest or if they're at stress, they're in stress, but to look at the tissue characteristics of the, of the, of the myocardium and to see if there's a distribution uh, by this gadolinium enhanced uh, approach uh, of uh, any abnormalities uh, in, in, in the tissue. Uh, uh, I mean, yeah. Anesh really should speak to this. He is one of the world's experts, particularly as it relates to non-ischemic uh, evaluation uh, uh, using MRI. But the general approach, and before I let you uh, speak to this, is, is that uh, the, if you have, uh, you can only, you can address the issue of where the hyperenhancement is. Is it across the whole uh, br breadth and width of the myocardium? Is it transmural versus non-transmural? Is there a pattern? Uh, clearly, uh, what we know about coronary anatomy uh, and the distribution of, of blood flow is that it, there is a wavefront phenomenon. And so, uh, you know, if you see uh, patterns that are, uh, that are not, incon not are con inconsistent with a myocardial infarction, that points in a different direction. So maybe, Manesh, uh, really, I, I, I'm still in your thunder. You should oh, speak to no this. No thunder still. <laughs> well, I, I think this is, this is right. So what, what I would say is, uh, you know, for our patients with concerns about non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, I think MRI adds a little bit more because there are infiltrative and other tissue characteristics, as you said. For viability, listen, I think uh, the practicing community probably uses nuclear much more than MR for some very high sensitivity viability information. Certainly MR is useful. And I think, you know, for the congenital heart patients or the patients where you assume there's going to be repeat imaging, I think that's another strength that MR is going to have because if you can get the patients into a magnet over time, you're going to reduce that sort of lifetime radiation exposure. So there may be other benefits. Peter, how do you use MR? Do you use it for viability? Where do you use it in your practice? Mostly for viability. Uh -huh. I think it's uh, an excellent tool there, and it uh, you know provides us other images. You get dynamic images of the heart that uh, can confirm some of your echo findings or just let you see the, the structures in a different way. So it's a, it's a relatively commonly performed test in low EF patients. Yeah, so in the sort of very low EF patients, maybe even the guy we presented, the 73-year-old gentleman with the EF of 15, this is where maybe a viability test of some sort, nuclear, PET, or MR, or something right. might be of use. Uh, let me move quickly through the end here. Uh, just a few more slides. Mentioning CT angiography, this is a new kid on the block. Uh, I, I think the uh, technology is still advancing. It's not. I don't think we have uh, developed... We're, we're static yet uh, with regards to the, the potential of the technology. Where it is uh, used, I think, most commonly is when there are coronary anomalies uh, su suggested. I think that's a very standard approach is uh, you can follow the, uh, the coronary anomaly throughout the course, and I think that's very helpful for people who are making decisions about how to approach these patients, uh, either percutaneously or, or surgically. Uh, and I think in patients, as, as Peter mentioned, uh, who uh, have a low likelihood of coronary disease and where you want to avoid the risks of an invasive procedure, uh, the information, assuming there's not high calcium in this indices, uh, which you wouldn't expect in that population, uh, is, is probably fine for making decisions. So I think it's, it's still uh, uh, exactly, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure where this will end. I also want to highlight that, of course, uh, if you're working collaboratively with your radi uh, radiologist, uh, the images can be used for many different things as well, if, uh, depending on how they're, how they're done. So. so you may get, you may be able to hit a few birds with a, with one stone, right? right. So, uh, Eric, I think that's been a great overview of the sort of general modalities of imaging we could do. Um, so, Peter, maybe you can tell me about how you make decisions. So we have a 73-year-old gentleman, diabetes, hypertension, EF of 15%. This is, I think, you know, even if you said the EF was for anywhere between 15 and 40. This is now bread and butter revascularization in the United States and where I think a lot of our colleagues in our own groups here are talking about how do we make decisions? Do they get uh, PCI? Do they get cabbage? Do they get medical therapy plus the revascularization or just medical therapy? How do you, how do, you do that these days? Well, it's a little complicated. We, we always like to refer to the evidence. And <laughs> right. uh, I have a few slides. Oh, great. Let me slides. have you show us a few slides that talk to that. You might have to uh, pass through a few. Um, can skip some. Yeah. 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 So this patient has three vessel disease, so you've actually made it a little bit easier, uh, you know, for us. Um, so the Syntax trial you know, just presented their three-year outcomes. And as most surgeons expected, the uh, curve started to diverge. So initially, the, the coronary bypass patients had higher risk and uh, higher mortality, but uh, that quickly changed. And so now there's a survival advantage for surgery in the three vessel disease population. 
um, when you subdivide this by the syntax score, you can find a, a tercile, a low tercile, where they look fairly equivalent. I'm showing the MACE outcome here, not the mortality. But you can see that there's you know, still a slight advantage in mortality to surgery there. But when you get to a syntax score above 22, uh, here's the second tercile and here's the third, you see uh, the curves uh, pretty much support the coronary bypass option for the average patient within this. But this really highlights some of our problems in, in the evidence because you can only subdivide these uh, patients so much. So you can't really answer questions about uh, ejection fraction, presence of diabetes, other features that, uh, that might influence the outcome because the total number here is insufficient to do further stratification. Many would argue that even this stratification is not legitimate um, based on, you know, the uh, primary endpoint not being met. You know, having said that, um, it causes physicians to have to extrapolate from a lot of other databases and make inferences from these data to, to make the decisions. Um, this patient, for example, wouldn't even be in this trial because he would have been excluded for a reduced ejection fraction. And, you know, that is what makes life so interesting. So when I think about the imaging uh, and, and related to the, the decision making, you know, it's pretty clear that for three vessel disease and I had left main here, although the patient didn't have it, coronary bypass grabbing is generally indicated to prolong life, and revascularization is generally indicated as well. Um, determining the role of PCI requires that you calculate the syntax score, so that's the imaging impact of uh, coronary angiography on this decision point. So syntax score less than 22, you know, it's possible that uh, PCI might be preferred. And, uh, you know, those, those kind of patients would not be this patient. You know, syntax score in the high range would only probably be considered for PCI in a case where the comorbid features of the patient made the surgery risk high, very high. And, uh, and I think in the end we're going to end up with some kind of uh, system where we use syntax score, uh, you know, as kind of permissive, but we're using the coronary surgery risk score as well to try to make the decisions. And teamwork is obviously a key part of this. I think it's a great sort of presentation of the data, uh, Peter. And, you know, you and I had an interesting sort of uh, experience in that we spent approximately a year working on the appropriate use criteria for coronary revascularization right. before the syntax trial was presented. And as a group and with our colleagues, we sort of hinged on a few areas. We said, you know, complexity of coronary artery disease, ischemic burden, medical therapy, and sort of obviously patient decision at the end, but those things were going to drive us to make decisions around the first question, which I think is a still maybe controversial question that Eric might speak to in a second, which is, does the patient need any revascularization compared to medical therapy? I think many believe in this scenario, and I, I suspect until we get to the very low EF patient, um, in the patient with an EF of 45 to 50 with three vessel disease, revascularization is clearly warranted and the decisions around the mode of revascularization are maybe the most contentious in the country right now, and I think you've laid out for us a nice way of doing it. But in my cath lab, and as you know, you come down there, we, we, we have trouble calculating a syntax score. You know, it's, it's, it's a very difficult sort of thing to do on the fly. So in this guy, we have 100% RCA, so that CTO kind of really does push up a score, as you know. The other two vessels are in, uh, affected, including PROX, LED, and, and so I would, have, I would have said, just guessing, this person's probably got a moderate syntax score. No left main involvement, so it's probably in the mid-range. If we did a subgroup analysis of a trial that didn't meet its primary endpoint, as you said. Right. So, I'm sorry, you're, you can't take the time to calculate the syntax score. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, it interferes with it. No, well, fact, I, I think the other point that needs to be, uh, you know, I think, and, and to your credit, you raised it uh, from the very beginning, is, uh, the patients that, that are uh, example, yeah. and, and uh, uh, that patient is not represented yeah. in syntax or any uh, study. Frankly. Or a lot aren't. At least, right. you know, the part of the main main problem with our revascularization trials, which is still good, is that they had to feel some sort of equipoise going into the trial, and so that led to a lot of exclusions mm -hmm. off the bat. And then even speaking about the calculation of the syntax score or, let's say, the STS score when we're talking about the bypass, it's not being routinely done, I'll just say, because of the complexity of the scores. You could certainly say they should be done, and maybe we'll have some electronic tools to help us. But I would say, you know, in the current day and age, we, we make these decisions 
of extrapolation. We take the best available evidence and we're trying to extrapolate it. In this patient, would you do anything else before we made this decision? Well, it's interesting. You know, as you look at this patient, the patient has angina. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of people would say, well, there's viability there. Yeah. You know, we've got uh, three vessel disease, and we've got reduced ejection fraction. And most people believe that the reduced ejection fraction patient uh, does have higher risk, but has more to gain. And you know, many studies have shown that the longevity impact of surgery is actually enhanced uh, in this kind of a setting. You really have to go back and determine, you know, when is the absolute risk too high to, to make an offering. And I, and I would mention one thing, pulmonary hypertension is a, is a significant risk factor in a patient like this if it's due to left ventricular dysfunction or diastolic dysfunction. And, uh, you know, having said that, it's, it's one of the things that sometimes dissuades surgeons. You know, so when you see that uh, tricuspid regurgitation uh, jet being too, too fast, you go, hmm, you know, that patient's going to have high risk. But we've never really done the research to indicate that you're actually losing benefit through that. You're probably just increasing risk. But well, I, I think the issue there is that, you know, this is where imaging does really, I think, help in that particular situation where, you know, something that's easily repeatable, and I, uh, uh, the echo, for example, uh, could help guide if there's a time that you, what you're saying is, is it fixed pulmonary hypertension or is it modifiable? Is the patient presenting an acute decompensated heart failure with high elevated pressures that you can modify based on the treatment of the acute decompensated state to make him a less riskier patient mm -hmm. in the operating room? And I think the answer to that is probably yes. And using these tools to monitor that progress so that you can make a decision at not only of should we, but when should we, I yes. think, is, is also very helpful. So um, so maybe I'll show you how the case resolved, and you guys can tell me. Wait, I, could I make one more point? Yeah, please. You know, because we really didn't talk about ischemia, you know, yeah. as much, or viability, as much as I, I, I would think that we could, yeah. you know, because it's not ne necessarily true that the presence of angina is sufficient. Exactly. That's right. And there's conflicting evidence in the literature uh, in this regard. You know, I, I've written here... Um, that in the, in the absence of ischemia-induced sudden death, which would be an indication regardless, uh, what, what is the role of uh, further viability testing? You know, we take patients who are at high risk with three vessel disease, and we think a lot about how to exclude patients that we don't think will do well. And, uh, but at the same time, it's, it's really important not to exclude patients who could do well. Um, so I have written here, you know, absence of viability in the area of revascularization that, that weighs against revascularization. Um, but then you have to consider the reliability of the test. You know, to really say there's nothing viable in there, you have to really 100% uh, confidence that that's true, or you're denying a patient a, a therapy that could potentially prolong their life. And, and I think uh, sometimes we overthink these things uh, in an attempt to uh, use this, these clinical paradigms to improve upon the overall result, which is that revascularization prolongs life in these patients. And, um, you know, I, my feeling is unless there's strong evidence that there's no viability, uh, that you should proceed with revascularization. And we've already discussed, you know, the, the treatment choices and how we make those. Yeah, let me, let me follow up on that because you've raised uh, something that we really should have spent some more time on, I think. And, and I think the issue of of what does viability information provide you? Well, I think we can, at this point, even though the data is extremely limited, and limited because it's, there are small studies that are centered uh, with, with major selection biases done in labs where they are biased against or, or for the result, uh, um, viability really addresses the issue of functional recovery. Is there going to be a high likelihood that this patient ha who has viable myocardium, that if revascularization were to be successful, and the patient were to survive that revascularization, that, that viable myocardium would improve its function. I think most of us feel that that link between viability and function recovery is quite strong. Unfortunately, we don't know if the premise is right. We don't know, as, as Peter has said, whether uh, we, it, it would make a lot of sense that people who have had functional recovery have better outcomes. But actually, that's not necessarily what the data has shown. And in fact, uh, you know, when you ask a patient, would you rather be alive or would you have better EF, uh, 
most people would say, I'd rather be alive. Mm -hmm. um, and there are many other mechanisms that have been postulated you know, around tethering, around the, sol the, the, the sol solidifying the matrix and other things, uh, where you may not improve potentially uh, functional, uh, uh, function you may have a functional recovery, but you may in fact improve people's survival uh, after vascularization. So it, it can go both ways, and I think uh, the only other comment I'll add is that I've, I've had the, um, the honor of actually uh, 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 being part of the leadership of a trial we're going to speak to, and I had the opportunity to present cases around viability and revascularization similar to this patient uh, around the world in many different centers, and I can tell you it is a, it's a crap shot yeah. who, uh, who gets viability and who doesn't, and in fact data from our own institution uh, suggests that there are su substantial biases uh, 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 in patients who are referred for viability are usually older. The UV had previous revascularization. They uh, are more likely to ha come from uh, gender or, or socioeconomic uh, disadvantaged uh, uh, groups. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's a mixed bag. Yeah, no. Having done a lot of viability <laughs> testing, I'll tell you what I like about viability testing is it always has an answer for somebody. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> and, right. and, and, and a viability testing is not a yes no question. And there's gradations of viability. So we actually haven't studied it well enough to know how much and what, and what I, I, to speak to your point, Eric, I'll say, what I know about viability testing is it's a marker for a high-risk patient. Yes. And that's probably the most, the, 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 the most reproducible data. Then what we do with it, how good our surgeons or PCI docs or revascularization is, is a, it sort of plays a big role. Well, thanks for a great conversation here, guys. Maybe I'll end this with a, just a couple of quick slides here on the patient. So here's a, the patient did go for a viability study, and here's the MRI, and you can see on the top there's a cine function of the patient, and you can see, in fact, it is a dilated, thinned ventricle. Um, and on delayed enhancement, you can see, interestingly, that uh, although there's transmural infarction at the very true apex, there's a rim of, of viability. So, you know, again, the answer here wasn't, yes, no, it's viable. It was, well, there's a lot of dysfunction. About 50% of the transmurality is infarcted in the anterior wall, about a 50% chance of recovery if you believe some of the prior data. Apically, it's transmural infarcted. And, as Peter said, maybe we should have just taken them straight away for cabbage. Without the test, we eventually did. These pictures are actually interesting because the patient got both by bypass surgery and a small door procedure. And you can see at the end of the three months after he's alive, comes back, gets back in the MRI scanner, actually can uh, hold their breath for 30 seconds to get these pictures. So you know they're functionally doing fairly well. The EF has actually improved and the ventricle seems to be at least morphologically improved. Whether this leads to a long-term outcome, I think you and others are helping us answer it. Um, so I think there's just an illustrative case of the points we talked about. And I'll just put this slide last up for Eric maybe to just give us an update. And tell sure, us I, mean, I have no answers, but I think the, the, uh, the patient that we just uh, shared and discussed and the issue we discussed are, are, uh, is one of the great controversies, I think, uh, um, in terms of how clinical practice, uh, uh, you know, we've, we, we've evolved. Uh, we are taking more and more of these patients who are considered at substantial risk for, the, for operation uh, to the operating room. Forty percent or more of bypass surgery patients have low ejection fraction, and those patients were actually excluded from all the trials of cabbage versus medical therapy. Uh, in fact, the meta-analysis, I think, uh, has only about 100 out of 2,400 patients who had predominant heart failure symptoms or a low EF. So this is a population that's not been studied uh, in, in randomized trials. We, did, we are doing this, this trial, and uh, if you wait a few months uh, at the ACC, you'll hear the re results of, of one of the arms of that trial. And the primary question stitch was, how does coronary surgery uh, add incrementally uh, to current contemporary evidence-based, guideline-based medical therapy and device therapy, uh, not including PCI? Yes, sure. Okay? Um, and uh, PCI was not excluded, but it, it, it was part of medical therapy. Uh, and, uh, you know, we approached uh, this um, uh, with two major hypotheses. One is in patients who were going to surgery because uh, the equipoise wasn't there uh, and they had a, a, a ventricle that appeared to be uh, uh, dyskinetic or akinetic in the apex and septum uh, and could be amenable to the door procedure, uh, we asked the question, does the door procedure add incrementally to revascularization with cabbage? And the result uh, at least for me, uh, as I am one of the authors, uh, uh, it, it was very clear with a hazard ratio of one, there was absolutely no incremental advantage of the door procedure in a patient study um, uh, with a, at an increased cost um, and no improvement in symptoms. And I guess that speaks to me of the importance of potentially of revascularization. Um, uh, uh, 
Peter should comment on that. I'm sure the surgeons have a slightly different uh, opinion and, and more data is needed uh, and is coming out and, and that will help inform this. You know, that I will make a couple of comments. I mean, one is that, uh, you know, bypass surgery obviously is pretty effective in those patients. Uh, and then when they got an SVR, the SVR was actually effective because the volumes were actually reduced uh, as, you know, intended. But uh, the mortality benefit of that was not there, and uh, quality of life was not there, and symptom relief was not there compared to cabbage alone. So uh, it's been a controversial result, as, as most people are aware. And um, I think the, the primary thing that's most surgical criticisms I've heard of the study have been that uh, in order to get into the trial, the equipoise had to be there that the SVR or the door procedure uh, could be done or not done, and that many patients with significantly more serious problems We're might have still benefit. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, the jury's not out, and most of those data are observational surgical series, which are not the strongest type of evidence. And, and we will have some more information to, get, to, to add to that in, in the near future. The, the other hypothesis, which I think will be presented in a few months at, uh, as an ACC late breaker, uh, uh, is the results of the comparison in 1,212 patients uh, between uh, continuing medical therapy in patients with multivessel disease and heart failure and LV dysfunction, just like our patient, and uh, with or without cabbage. Uh, uh, and I think that really gets to the crux of where the evidence has been lacking. Uh, uh, those patients were never randomized, and medical therapy during the uh, cabbage medical comparisons from the 70s uh, is not the medical therapy that you and I use now. We didn't use Hatsprin. We didn't have a Lima uh, in surgery. We, you know, things were very different. Uh, so it's going to be a very interesting time, uh, and the results are still pending. Uh, the important thing to highlight is, is these are perhaps some of the best phenotype patients, uh, imaging-wise, ever ever studied. We have, uh, we will have echoes, uh, serial echoes on all these patients. We have ischemia and viability testing through multiple modalities, uh, stress echo, stress. M uh, uh, stress nuclear and MRI. Uh, so I think we will be smarter, I don't know, whatever the result, about how to approach these patients uh, in the next, uh, after the next few months are over. So I, I, I think uh, with that, I don't have any more information. I'm sorry. Uh, that's I, I great. Know. That's great, Eric. <laughs> I, want to, I want to congratulate you on getting the trial done. It's a monumental effort. And again, thank you both for a great conference on how we think about heart failure patients and imaging. Uh, our guest faculty today, just to re reiterate, have been Peter Smith and Eric Velasquez, both uh, colleagues of mine. What a great discussion. So until next time, then, from all of us here at Duke, this is Manesh Patel saying thanks for joining us and take care.